So that was a replay of the historic signing of this letter between Kim Jong-un and President Trump uh, that took place within the last 20 minutes, and it is an historic moment. Joining us now to discuss all of this, author of Dear Reader, the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il, uh, Michael Malice, and uh, Il is the father of Kim Jong-un. Uh, he was number two in the, uh, the Kim dynasty, correct? Yeah, second comes right after first. Uh, yeah, right. So let me ask you this. We've just witnessed what we think is historic, but now we need to find out what's going on in that letter. Sure. Can number three, can uh, Kim Jong-un deliver, or is he going to face some kind of pushback uh, from the old guard? Oh, no. I mean, whenever there's a, there's been two changes of leadership in the North Korean dynasty, and whenever this happens, there's a purge, and uh, people are either demoted or sent to be ambassadors abroad. North Korea is the opposite of a meritocracy. The people who are there at the top are there explicitly because of their loyalty to the leader. Um, in fact, Kim Jong-il uh, exiled his uh, stepmother, uh, and he had her under armed guard at all times as she descended into madness. No one knows when she died or, or anything like that. So no one is safe. Uh, and it's again, it's there simply as a function of the loyalty. And we just saw very recently he snapped his fingers and three generals were, you know, were fired and, and replaced just like that. He doesn't have to answer to anyone. Well, we just had a headline crossing Dow Jones, Trump uh, says, and Harold's very comprehensive agreement signed with Kim Jong-un. You know, we've been talking about this new era in leadership, yeah. a, a younger generation that's been schooled abroad, that has a sense of what the Western world looks like, how the Western world lives. Do you think that was helpful in, in getting to this point? Yeah, because it's very hard to have a government that's based on lies and propaganda and claiming that the leader has magical powers and things like that when, you know, the young people are watching soap operas and uh, news from the outside world and have an understanding that, you know, this is not only old-fashioned, it's also absurd. And, you know, when you don't have this faith in the state and you don't have food from the state, it's very hard to maintain your hold on power. But let's assume, as the president said, denuclearization is now on the table, yes. that that will begin very quickly in return. Uh, Kim Jong-un allows food and perhaps investment in North Korea. How does he maintain control if his people start to get nourished and if he starts opening up? Well, that, that is the trick. I mean, w there's a quote from either Steinbeck or Hemingway, I always forget, how did you go bankrupt two ways, gradually and then suddenly? So when these regimes collapse, they do it very quickly and seemingly overnight. Mm -hmm. And what's dangerous is the leaders... No one's talking about collapse, though. Well, <laughs> We're still in the, immense, in the midst of a comprehensive well, uh, let, agreement. Let, let me talk about collapse, because what happens is when you have the entire population finding out that it was, in fact, Kim Il-sung who started the Korean War and not what they refer to us as the U.S. imperialists, that's going to be very hard to keep under wraps. It's going to be very hard to have a justification for Kim Jong-un to maintain his whole in power simply because he's Kim Jong, Kim Il-sung's grandson, and an heir to the Mount Pek Two bloodline. Mm -hmm. Well, we are having the signing taking place in Singapore, which I think is also emblematic of a one-family rule sure. <laughs> over an island state sure. for multiple decades. Are you saying that that can't happen in North Korea? Correct, because uh, Lee Kuan Yew did not have Singapore be isolated from the outside world. Lee Kuan Yew did not do, as uh, Kim Il-sung said, punish the enemies of the revolution to three generations. He didn't have concentration camps and he didn't have food used as a mechanism of political control. So while uh, it's a free... I just think using the word collapse is just getting ahead of ourselves. It's already collapsed in the 90s, and there was a famine where one to two million people were starved by the state, and they refused to allow the UN in to feed the population. So uh, the problem is, again, once people have information, it's very, very hard to keep them uh, submissive. Don't go anywhere. Uh, we want to keep you right here, because we're going to bring in former U.S. Army police sergeant and Iraq war veteran uh, Chris Nawami. Did I pronounce your last time correctly, Chris? You did not, but you're not the first person to do that, so... That's okay. I apologize. How do we pronounce your last name very quickly? Nywame. Nywame. It's good to meet you, and thank you for joining us. Good uh, to be what, with you. What you have witnessed here, and as Michael was just saying, there's a great deal at stake in so many ways. Uh, one of the questions has been, will the U.S. possibly withdraw soldiers and troops from South Korea? We don't know what has been agreed to or what is in the process of being agreed to. What concerns do you have and what uh, hopes do you have? Well, I think we're going to have to kind of wait and see. I'm assuming this is a framework for steps to getting rid of the weapons and, and moving along in a, in, a, in a manner where we can actually see those things. I'd predict we do not remove troops. It doesn't surprise me that Secretary Mattis has issued uh, some reservations about that. I think we would need to be a long way down the road of looking at compliance and making sure those weapons are removed before we lift sanctions. But moving in troops, I, I, I think that's too soon to say. But I would say one of my uh, 
observations would be if they walk back on something, I could see the president uh, axing uh, th this road. But I, I feel pretty optimistic, and this is kind of amazing what we're seeing happen. I'm just wondering about uh, security then in the region. If you're China looking at this, what are you thinking? Well, you're looking at opportunities. I mean, I think China kind of uh, putting on these sanctions has been helpful, but I just don't think we're going to see uh, the U.S. Army and those forces uh, reducing. I mean, we've seen some issues when it came to Iraq where the forces that we left in place uh, were not able to maintain their foothold. So it's sort of this balance of not wanting to keep U.S. troops somewhere in perpetuity, but also keeping a strong security presence. But I think that would be one of the very last steps moving U.S. troops out of that region without a regional security agreement uh, with our allies. So I think that's a little bit further down the road. I, I want to bring Mike Malice back in because he has, he's been to North Korea. He, he's written about the, the Kim dynasty, the family. And the, the issue you were touching upon, which is keeping control of all of this or potentially in the future, right. they may not be there. The South Koreans have got to be looking at this with some optimism, but also trepidation because the future is unknown. Oh, absolutely. And they don't want, I mean, the Chinese as well, they don't want a failed state where you have 25 million people who don't, have never been on the Internet, you know, swarming into Manchuria and, and who aren't able to speak Chinese. So that's the problem. If you're going to transition North Korea into a more liberal direction, you want to have some sort of parachute and a soft landing for that transition because it's going to be very hard again once the people find out they've been spent sent 70 years, you know, being told, you know, complete another lies that Kim Il-sung can literally walk on water and, and so on and can make bullets out of leaves. Yeah. Well, Chris, uh, what about the troops uh, in South Korea then? I mean, this is a DMZ. When people go to South Korea, they look across the border. It's a two and a half mile border that separates North and South. Right. I mean, it kind of reminds you of like, the kind of environment for, like the movie Terminator or something. It's very, uh, there's sort of a feel. I mean, many uh, soldiers that I serve with in the Army have served in South Korea and have been in that area. You know, I just, I, I don't see the troops moving until we're able to do something else. But, you know, I, I give the president a lot of credit with what he's done. This has been great. My only critique, and to kind of comment what Michael was saying, is, I mean, they, they, we've sent, like, American doctors in there to do great things and, the pe and have healed people and perform surgeries. And then after they're healed, they thank the supreme leader. I mean, it is such a psychologically unusual place. So I don't necessarily know that the glowing remarks about Kim really loving his country, I don't know that that's necessarily true, but I do think he does not want to meet the end of a dictator that gets captured or killed, yes. which often happens if we do end up in a conflict, which we're now hopefully moving further and further away from. Well, Chris, how are the, the roughly, what is it, 28,000 men and women who served in the U.S. Armed Forces in South Korea, how are they viewing all of this, do you think? It's going to be just another day for them. Another day for them. I mean, our troops are, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, veterans have a variety of different opinions. Uh, they did vote for Trump two to one in this last election, but active duty troops, they're out there doing the job. I mean, they're, they're sacrificing. They're probably not throwing this around too much politically, but I'm sure they would like to see uh, great foreign policy success for their country. But for them, it's just another day. The military is constantly training, constantly uh, preparing for, for anything. But sure, I think the easing of tension, the uh, decreasing the likeliness of war, I think is always a good thing for our U.S. military. Well, if you're stationed in South Korea, North Korea is seen as a clear and present danger. So I'm just wondering quickly, Chris, how do you feel about the president inviting Kim Jong-un to the White House? I think it's good to keep things on the table. I mean, I think that this is there's a lot of psychological, you know, kind of warfare going here. I think the president's tough terminology really worked, and he got a lot of criticism okay. back here in the States. Thank but, you so much, Chris and Michael. Thank you again. Thank you. Now, President Trump and Kim Jong-un were all smiles for the cameras today, but did their body language tell a different story?